Okay, so uh, wine appreciation, I kind of tried to think what, what might be a good analogy uh, and perhaps appreciating uh, a work of art like a glass of wine or a bottle of wine is similar to appreciating a, a, a work of uh, visual art. Uh, so perhaps by slowing down and looking at it in different ways and maybe having somebody point out as a, an experienced taster point out something you should be looking for can help you really get the most out of each, each wine that you assess and enjoy uh, and taste. Uh, tasting wine might be like watching a finely tuned athlete. Uh, 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 and appreciating wine is kind of like appreciating the, the elegance and the mastery uh, uh, level that, that they've gotten to through years of training. And it's certainly, of course, like enjoying or appreciating good foods, a uh, nice, nice dish, and, and the two, of course, go uh, very well hand in hand. Uh, and we'll, do, we'll look at uh, food and wine uh, pairing principles on week four. Uh, uh, yes, week four. Uh, so looking forward to that. Uh, so if you have a glass of wine at home, now is a good good time to taste. Were you able to pick up a wine, uh, Alan and Chuck? Something to uh, to to explore? Maybe either the Fulinari Pinot Grigio I'd, I'd recommended. I know Chuck, I just sent that uh, late last night. Uh, but if if you're able to pick up uh, any wine to assess, we can uh, go through. Very good. Alan is the Fulinari Pinot Grigio. Oh, very good. Okay, so Chuck, you have both wines for today's class. And Alan, uh, when we get to the uh, oak uh, com component for the red wine, uh, were you able to pick that up as well? Excuse me. Very good. Excellent. Great. So, uh, excellent. So, that would be a good way to learn along and taste along. So, if you have the um, Fulinari Pinot Grigio here, we'll go through the uh, four steps to wine appreciation. So, with every wine, and it's the same, more or less the same for beer or cider or spirits uh, are assessed in, in much of the same way. So there are four things you want to do for each of these wines. You may be familiar with these steps already, uh, but there are four steps. The first is appearance. So just holding the, the glass of wine away from you and you hold it on kind of a 45 degree angle. And then you look down through, ideally you'd have an ISO glass. And I happen to have one here. <laughs> So this is kind of an ideal wine tasting glass um, and you'll want to hold it kind of on an angle and then you look down through the top of the glass and that's, that's how you gauge the appearance of your wine. And, um, and so the first step is the appearance and then once, and it's, it's not the most fun, it's enjoyable and it, and it really kind of whets your appetite and gives you some clues as to uh, what the wine might be like and, and some idea on, on some parts of the wine. And once you've assessed the appearance, then you look at the nose. So bring it to your, up, to your, up to your nose and don't be afraid to put your nose right into the glass. So one of the first things I learned in sommelier school was get, get your nose right in there um, and, and give, it a, give it a good sniff. So um, what, what you ideally want are short, quick sniffs, just like so just short, uh, repeated sniffs, and that's going to stimulate your. There's a receptor in, in the in the top of our nose is called the olfactory bulb, and as you take rather than taking a long, drawn out sniff, you take short, quick sniffs that will stimulate this olfactory bulb um, a number of times, and you really smell these complex, you know, raspberries or mango or vanilla. These all these uh, really lovely aromas uh, in our wine. Uh, so once you've done appearance and nose, the third step. Is the most fun is the palate. Uh, so this is where you take take a sip and you can spit or swallow depending on um, social responsibility and where you are in your day and what you have to do after and how you're feeling about enjoying your Sunday afternoon. We're having a lovely Sunday day down here in Niagara. Hope you are too um, uh, where you are. Uh, so so palate is problem is certainly the most fun. So taste and and make sure you swish it around your whole mouth. So uh, there are different different parts of our mouths perceive sweetness or acidity or bitterness uh, stronger than other parts of our mouth. So as you swish it all around your front of your gums and sides of your mouth and top of your tongue, bottom of your tongue, and really swish it around, you get a good taste. Uh, what you can also do is draw a little bit of oxygen over the wine. So if I had this water, let's say it was wine. And just by pulling a little bit of oxygen into your mouth, 
and you know, kind of breathing it, bringing it out your nose. Uh, you'll agitate the wine. That's that's what you could hear me kind of slurping or gurgling. Uh, and that's really going to pull these aromas uh, retronasally back through the back of your nose into the olfactory bulb, and you'll really smell the the, the aromas of, of your wine. So in the Pinot Grigio, I, I chose a fairly neutral, easy drinking, simple simple wine. Uh, so there might be lemon. Um, uh, you know, if you get a lemon aroma, that's great. Maybe a green apple or yellow apple, perhaps maybe a floral component. Uh, but it's fairly simple wine, so so let's not worry too much. But just just to go through the steps was was the purpose of um, of trying this wine, and it's a good category to to be aware of. Um, large large category that really became popular in the um, 1990s. So once you've done the appearance, the nose, and the palate, then you want to assess the finish, kind of like the aftertaste, but the 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 correct term is finish, and this is how long the pleasant flavors will linger. So. Um, maybe, maybe I've gone in too much detail for this intro slide. We'll, we'll, I'll show you those again. Uh, but the four steps are, are appearance, nose, palate, and finish. Uh, so uh, if you want to remember the process and really get the most from your tasting, all you have to remember are the six S's. Uh, so there are six S's to wine appreciation. Uh, we talked a little bit about some of them. So uh, the six S's are see, swirl, sniff, sip, swish, and savor. Uh, so the six S's. Uh, so C again is is looking at the appearance through through the glass, and then you'll want to swirl your glass uh, gently. If you if you need a flat surface like a desk or a table or a bar um, to to keep the keep the base of your glass on as you swirl, you can use a flat a flat surface, and that will help uh, by swirling either on a surface or in the air. Uh, it'll release a lot of the aromas. There all these aromas are locked into the wine, and by aerating it or agitating it, you're releasing those volatile, lovely smelling uh, fruit and floral and mineral uh, aromas into the glass. And then, uh, you, uh, and then, so once you stick your nose after swirling, you'll sniff and really smell those uh, lovely aromas. So see, swirl, sniff, and then sip. Again, uh, sip, spit or swallow. Swish, make sure you swish the wine around your whole mouth. So see, swirl, sniff, sip, swish. And then savor, savor talks about the finish of, uh, of the wine. So. Uh, the six S's of, uh, of wine tasting. So uh, looking at each of the four categories, so appearance, nose, palate, and finish, um, we'll talk about what you're looking for uh, on, or what you're trying to get out of each of those uh, steps. So on the appearance of a wine, there are two things you're trying to evaluate. Uh, one is the intensity of the color, is it pale? You know, on a white wine, it's really light, light, lightly pigmented uh, and, and really kind of translucent, transparent. Uh, or is it medium, somewhere in the middle, or is it really deep? Is You know, you'll still be able to see through a, even a deep white wine, uh, but it, it, you, there'll be a lot more color to a lot more color intensity. Uh, and that's different than the color itself, because you can have you can have a pale gold wine, just like you can have a medium lemon. Uh, wine, let's say, or possibly even a deep lemon uh, wine. So you're looking for intensity, which is the the concentration of the color, the intensity of the color, and the color itself. So for white wines, is it lemon? Think of a think of a yellow lemon. Is it gold? Like a, a gold will have a little bit of orange to it. It'll be mostly lemon with a little bit of orange, like a wedding band. Uh, and most wines will be pale lemon for whites. Some in the gold that can indicate age or sweetness or oak aging. Uh, and very rarely will you see a brown, but the idea of brown is just like when you bite an apple and leave it on the counter, it'll start to oxidize with time. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me, and that so that's that's the browning, and wines will wines will eventually do that as well. It takes takes a much longer time with a sealed wine, uh, but eventually it's on its way to to a browned, an oxidate uh, oxidized wine, and that and that won't taste uh, very good. So most wines will be uh, lemon or gold, and and most wines, in fact, are, are pale lemon, white wines. Uh, for red, again, you're looking for intensity. Pale, you know, can you can you read text through it like a really fine Prince Edward County Pinot Noir, uh, or is it medium, a little bit deeper, or is it deep and you, and you really it's opaque and to the point where you can't actually see, you know, even the stem. Uh, if you look down through the top of a deep red wine, maybe wine number two might be medium or deep today uh, for red wine intensity. Uh, but on a deep red wine, uh, you, you, when you look down through the top of the glass, you, you can't see where the where the stem connects to the to the bowl. 
Uh, so for red wine, pale, medium, or deep. And then the colors are, are a little bit different, obviously. So the most common is ruby. Uh, so think of a ruby gem. So uh, most red wines will be medium ruby. Uh, but with a little bit of age, uh, they'll start to turn a kind of a brick brown or garnet brown. That's just a hint of that um, oxidation. And just like white wines are eventually going to, with a long enough period of time, the better quality of the wine, the longer it takes. Uh, but the, all wines will eventually oxidize, oxidize out to, to brown. So that's appearance on the nose. Um, we want to assess two things. The first is the wine sound. Is it clean? Uh, so just like maybe when you sniff the, the milk, if it's questionable, if it's too close to the expiration date, you're just looking for, is this something that's going to, that's going to be pleasant and, and most all wines should be pleasant. Uh, you can get different aromas. We'll talk about petrol for Riesling next week, which is a good aroma toast, or, um, you can get some, some fairly unique, you can get earthy or kind of barnyard almost. And those are actually all technically clean. Uh, but where a wine might be faulty, uh, there are three major faults uh, that are listed here. So if your wine smells like musty basement, uh, that's cork taint, TCA, uh, musty basement or um, uh, wet cardboard, wet dog, uh, that can indicate a corked wine, a TCA. And with, with corked wine, you can actually get it uh, even in a, in a screw cap because cork taint can come from the barrels or the walls of the winery where the wine's produced. Uh, or even the boxes that, that they're carried in. So you can get a corked taint even in a screw cap wine, and that will taste like or smell like musty, musty basements. And with all of these, if you get musty basement or struck matches, picture kind of that sulfury, freshly struck match aroma. Uh, those are both false struck matches, more of a sulfur uh, issue. Uh, so too much sulfur usage in, in, in the making, or, or maybe it's out of balance and it smells a little bit like struck matches or onions or garlic or skunk. Uh, and then a third type is a kind of a vinegary aroma. And as that progresses, it might become um, like a, a ethyl acetate, which is a kind of smells like nail polish remover. So if it smells like vinegar, nail polish remover, glue is another kind of fault in this range. Uh, or if it smells like the other two faults, musty basement or struck matches, then then you can, uh, it won't hurt you. You might get a headache if, if you drink this wine, if it's really faulty. Uh, it won't, it's safe, uh, but it won't, won't be pleasant. Usually the, the fruit aromas have disappeared and it's, it's fair to send it back either to the LCBO where they should exchange it or at the table to reject it uh, from your sommelier and, and have them open a, a clean, a sound uh, new wine for, for you and your, your guests. Uh, so once you've determined the wine is sound, uh, then you, that's when it's kind of the fun part. You're kind of looking for these aromas. And what I always suggest is look for familiar aromas. So there will almost always be fruits, uh, some forms of fruit aromas in your wine. Uh, for red wine, raspberries, cherries are very common. For white wine, lemon, uh, green apples, yellow apples, floral aromas are very common. Uh, you might get different flowers or spices like clove or nutmeg or cinnamon or ginger, white pepper, for example. So just try and look for familiar smells. And, and don't necessarily look for all these flowery descriptors, you know, 10 aromas per wine. If you can pick out the main aroma to the wine, uh, and again, this is a fairly simple Pinot Grigio, so there may only be one or two aromas, or maybe three or four if you're really uh, in tune with it. Uh, but if you can pick out lemon, like a nice lemon aroma in, in this wine, I think uh, I think that's a good start. And if you can always try and look for the most pronounced, the most noticeable aroma, whether it's lemons or cherries or peaches or, or whatever the wine uh, may be. So um, always look for fruits and there, there's often flowers or spices. And a, a good skill, so, so a lot of people often say, oh, I... I can, I can always tell when somebody says the aromas and then I can smell it. Uh, and, and if you're interested in learning how to detect the aromas and recognize them, that's where the issue lies. So we can all, when we smell a wine, virtually everybody can detect the lemon or peach or flower or raspberry aromas. Uh, but it's in the recognition. It's in that ability to go from detecting it in your nose uh, to, to saying it out loud. And that, that's a skill that can be developed through practicing, focused practice of tasting, which is great. Uh, means the more you taste and, and kind of work on building that skill, the better you'll get at it. Uh, and, uh, and, and, and it's, that's exactly it. It's a, it's a skill you can, you can develop.
What um, what aromas are you getting on on your Fulinary Pinot Grigio? Very good. Apple, great. So apple, citrus, lemon, and green apples. Yeah, you're perfect. You guys are fantastic. You're right, right in tune, and um, it's fairly simple wine. I think it's thirteen or 13 or 12 or 14 dollars something like that uh, so it's not going to have a lot of distinct unique aromas but it clearly has a uh, lovely apple and and cit citrus notes so that's that's fantastic guys very good uh so once you've done appearance and nose then you can go oh and this is this is a good resource too have you seen uh this before in your wine studies um along the road so this is the aroma wheel developed by ann noble at uc davis which is a um, major research in academia, uh, wine ac academia in California. And in the 90s, Anne Noble developed this aroma wheel, and it's a useful tool to help us um, describe what we're smelling. So the way it works um, is you pretty much start in the middle ring, which is the most uh, umbrella term or the most generic. So, for example, the purple ring in the bottom left, and you can download this from, you can do a Google search and, and pull this up pretty easily. Uh, but let's say in the in the purple ring that says fruity, and that's where you start. So when you smell wine, you start in the middle, and you say, is this wine fruity? Is it herbaceous or nutty or caramel or woody or earthy, et cetera? Floral, spicy. And then so if it is fruity, then you go to the next ring out. So if it's fruity, is it more of a dry fruit or tropical fruit? Are we getting citrus or berry or tree fruit? And then once you've got that kind of generic umbrella aroma descriptor like citrus, then you go to the furthest ring and you say, is it more grapefruit or is it lemon? Is it orange? Is it orange peel? Is it lemon peel? Is it lemon curd? You can get really descriptive in your in your uh, assessments. Uh, but again, it just kind of starts from, from the inside out. So you can gradually build um, build that skill to, to recognize which, which you guys have uh, shown really, really good uh, already so far. Uh, so once you've done appearance and nose, and then it's time for the palate. And the palate is is actually a fairly blunt instrument. It only detects sweet, sour, bitter, salty, and umami. Those are the only five tastes that the tongue can perceive. Um, and so when you uh, taste a wine, it'll often have sour, sometimes bitter, especially red wines and especially old cage wines. And it may have sweet if there's some residual sugar, especially like in a dessert wine, for example. Uh, but the tongue's only detecting those five things. There are some wines with a little bit of salty characteristic and maybe umami, uh, but really you're focusing on sweet, sour, and bitter are, are the main tastes you'll, you'll perceive in a wine. And so when you get flavors uh, like um, peaches or vanilla, uh, which seem sweet, but, they, but flavors aren't actually, they don't actually taste like anything because uh, flavors are just the aromas that are picked up retronasally. Uh, so as you kind of switch the wine around in your mouth, as it warms up with your body temperature in your mouth, and if you're drawing oxygen over, over the wine, as that oxygen goes down, it goes back through the, through the inside of your nose, nasal passage, and those flavors are detected by, by your nose uh, as opposed to your tongue. So, and then the brain kind of synthesizes. There's a really interesting book called I Taste Red, by um, Jamie Good, uh, a, a phenomenal book, and he talks about uh, synesthesia and, and all these really unique, uh, it's, it's very science oriented, but very approachable. Um, and, and part of what he says is that the brain kind of synthesizes an overall impression of our experience. Uh, so we'll talk about mouthfeel, as well as tastes, and then flavors, and then that'll bring it all together in our brains to say, uh, this is what the wine tastes like, or how experienced uh, the wine. Uh, so, and then once you've done uh, palate, then you're looking at the finish, and this is, again, how long the pleasant flavors last. So if there's, you know, some tannic grip, or it's really acidic, uh, you know, or sweet or sour or, or bitter, something like that, um, sweet or sour or bitter, uh, that's not, the, those aren't the pleasant flavors. The pleasant flavors can be lemons or nuttiness, can be honeyed, can be peachy, can be a fruit aroma, uh, but it's how long those pleasant flavors, those tastes 
basically the flavors, how long they last. And, and in addition to thinking about the character, so what characteristic the flavor has, uh, try and think about the nature of, of the finish. Is it complex? Is it a complex, nutty finish? Uh, or is it more of a tart, lemony finish that's really pleasant, like, a, for example, a Premier Cru Chablis? Uh, or, or many, many, many possible examples. Uh, okay, so uh, we got to, and, and you'll see me kind of just reaching on, just I don't have a clicker, uh, but uh, don't mind that, I'm just uh, flipping the flipping the next slide. Uh, and this slide here is a little refresher, you'll see this throughout the course. Um, <clears throat> chance for me to pull up a polling question, and we'll just do a quick review on uh, some of the ideas that uh, we've learned. So I have two questions for wine tasting. First question is, what are the four steps to tasting wine? Just a chance to review uh, some of the concepts. So option one, appearance, nose, palate, and finish. Option two, one, two, three, four. Or option three, step up to the plate. All right, very good, 100%, so no problems there. And yes, of course, the four steps to wine appreciation are appearance, nose, palate, and finish. Uh, so second question for this uh, section, which of the following aromas indicates a faulted wine? Option one, green apples, uh, cloves, fresh soil, or musty basement? And musty basement, yep, yeah, uh, bonus points if you can type it in. What uh, fault would, if you got musty, a, a musty basement aroma in your wine, which, what, what would you call that fault? Corked, yeah, very good. Cork issue, very good, Chuck, yeah, and Alan, thank you. Um, and the technical term, I'll type it in, just for your, if you're interested in some of this kind of wine geek kind of stuff. Uh, so corked wine or cork fault, cork taint, cork issue, uh, and the, the, Molecular term, the chem biochemical term is TCA, trichloroanisole. Uh, that's the actual molecule that this uh, musty cork bacteria produces. Uh, so it's not the actual bacteria that causes the musty smell, but it's a TCA aroma that it emits uh, that goes into the wine through the cork or through, through the capsule. Uh, so very good. Oops. There we go. Uh, so we can take maybe just a, a couple minute break. If you have any questions, feel free to relax. You can finish tasting your wine or, or whatever you like there. And uh, we'll go on with our next section uh, very shortly. Uh, okay, so good question. Will there be pairing Pinot Grigio with food? Uh, not for this class. Uh, so today we're just looking at wine tasting, uh, grape growing and wine making. Uh, so for class, Four, I believe it's four. I should check out my uh, syllabus. Uh, but I believe class four, we will look at food and wine pairing principles. And uh, I'm, I'm to be perfectly candid, I'm a wine wine first uh, kind of guy. I love pairing wine with food. I love good food. Uh, uh, but I'm, I'm for sure I'm a wine wine first kind of guy. So for the food and wine pairing principle, we talk about all these concepts and these ideas that will help pair really successfully. Uh, I hope. Uh, and we talk about classic pairings like champagne and caviar and you know, goat cheese and Loire Valley Sancerre. Um, uh, but I didn't, you know, if you'd like to pair some foods, then, then feel free. If, if you have the notes uh, available, you can ch check beforehand to see if you'd like to pair something. Uh, uh, but from my end, I, I, I'll, I'll pretty much just be teaching the, the ideas, if that makes sense. Uh, so let's go on to section number two for our course this afternoon. Uh, so wine making. Um, uh, so we looked at wine appreciation. We'll cover uh, wine. Uh, wine making has two parts. Uh, so we'll cover the first part is grape growing. So grape growing is also called viticulture, and that falls under the wine making umbrella because, of course, you can't make wine without grapes. And I love this proverb, you can't make good wine from bad grapes, uh, just indicating that um, in order to make some of these world-class wines, top-level Bordeaux, Rioja, Chianti Classico, Napa Valley, you know, 
wines in Ontario, wines all over the world. It really does, a lot of people believe the kind of this proverb uh, has, has a lot of truth to it, that you can't, in order to make a good wine, you need good, good base material. And that will take a look at all the concepts on how you can get uh, good quality grapes. Um, and that'll pretty much guide our, our, our section on grape growing. And then we'll, we'll go on to uh, the, the actual wine making as well. Uh, so, so uh, good question. What is terroir? We often hear, you know, terroir has this impact or terroir is this. And I, I feel there's a good grasp on, on what defines terroir, but let's just say it explicitly. Uh, so, so it's uh, out there. Uh, so uh, terroir, the definition of terroir is everything that affects how the grape grows. Uh, so certainly climate, and we'll take a look at cool, moderate, and warm climates on one of these slides. Uh, the soil is going to affect how it grows. Slope, we'll take the slope of a vineyard if it's on a hillside vineyard. Uh, grape variety is part of the terroir of, of a vine. And, and next week's going to be a great class on the different grape varieties um, and how they, how they express themselves. Uh, uh, also, uh, man, the winemaker, man, man or woman, uh, uh, will affect terroir in that um, the way they grow the vine, which we'll take a look at, and also the way they make the wine. Um, uh, perhaps more, more in the vineyard uh, will, will have an impact on, on what's defined as terroir. Now, yield is an interesting uh, point. Uh, so yield refers to the amount of grapes grown in a certain area of vineyard. Uh, so it's often measured in tons per acre or tons per hectare, if you're kind of European uh, minded, which I, I tend to be, um, uh, but it also tons per acre if you're more kind of Canada or, or USA uh, oriented. Uh, and so in addition to tons per acre, tons per hectare, it's also measured in volume, uh, which is hectoliters per hectare. So amount of volume of wine coming from the same hectare, hectares, I think 100 by 100, uh, 100 by 100, 100 meters by 100 meters is, is one hectare of land. And there's about two and a half. It's a, a nice conversion if you're if you're into math at all, like uh, quick math. Uh, there's about there's almost exactly two and a half acres in one hectare. Uh, so 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 uh, 10 hectares would be 25, roughly 25 acres. Uh, so yield is either tons per acre, tons per hectare, or ton, uh, hectoliters uh, per hectare. And to me, this picture uh, really shows beautifully the idea of terroir. Uh, this might be in Tuscany, by, by my best guess, uh, just a picture I pulled from the web. Uh, but you see the sloping vineyard, you have a little bit of fog impacting this late autumn uh, ripening of the grapes. You have the mountains in the background. Um, maybe some cool air descending from those. Um, uh, even things will look, uh, you, you may actually taste in the red, red wine, at some, uh, it's possible, uh, almost a eucalyptus, kind of a menthol or, um, you know, Vicks, Vicks cough candy kind of menthol eucalyptus thing. Uh, and the reason I bring that up is because in this picture we have cypress trees, uh, but in the part of Australia where, uh, southern Australia, where many Shiraz and Cabernet Sauvignons are from, there's quite a few eucalyptus trees, and those can, the aromas, the oils, the essential oils emitted from those eucalyptus trees can actually get land on the grapes and, and end up in the wine. So it is fairly common to get a wine from southern Australia uh, that has a menthol eucalyptus mint, uh, minty character to it. So, so to me, this is kind of a picture of terroir. Excuse me. And um, uh, have, you, have you heard this before? Um, most commercially viable vineyards of the world are found in the temperate zone. Uh, so both north and south between the latitudes of 30 to 50 degrees. So pretty much 30 degrees latitude uh, north to 50 degrees latitude north, where we find all the United States, most of Europe, all the wine producing, major wine producing regions of Europe fall in there. Um, uh, southern part of Canada, Okanagan Valley is just under 50. Uh, in the northern part of it, uh, Ontario and its wine producing regions. China is, uh, we'll, well, I think we'll start to see quite a bit of wine uh, coming online. That they've, uh, they're actually, uh, China's, uh, the, I believe, the fifth largest planted country in the world. And that's only in the last five to 10 years that they've really started to plant predominantly red wines. 
um, uh, but at a very, very rapid pace, which means that in the three years it takes a vine, three to five years it takes a newly planted vine to start producing grapes, uh, we'll start to see a lot of wine, a lot more wine coming out of uh, some of the great regions uh, of China. Uh, and as those vines age, the, the wines will uh, continue to get better. So uh, the wine regions of China find themselves between 30 and 50. In the southern hemisphere, southern Australia, all of New Zealand, uh, just the southern tip of Africa, so South Africa, is producing some great wines, as well as the, the uh, wine regions of Chile and Argentina. Uh, and we'll learn about uh, all of these regions, all these major regions in week three for Old World and uh, week uh, half of uh, the class for week four on uh, what's called New World, which is uh, Old World is essentially Europe and New World is, um, is outside of there. Uh, so in terms of climate, which has a large impact on the terroir of a grape, um, it's pretty much classified into three or maybe four major uh, climate classifications. So cool, uh, moderate, and warm are kind of the viable uh, ranges. And there are different definitions based on growing degree days or mean January, July temperature, um, different heat summations and average uh, one, you know, temperature, uh, average annual temperature. Uh, but they're loosely defined, which means there's no technically correct definition of cool climate or moderate or warm warm climate as well. The, the fourth climate is hot climate, and that's generally for, um, not for quality viticulture, but for raisins, table grapes. Um, uh, sometimes fortified wines can, can be made well in a, in a hot climate. Uh, but cool climate includes Northern France. We'll look at um, uh, Champagne in week five, uh, or week, perhaps week four. Uh, we'll look at Champagne in Northern France, Loire Valley, as well as Burgundy is fairly, at least Chablis would be certainly be cool climate. Uh, Germany, uh, all grape growing regions of Germany are cool climate in the, in the very Southwest predominantly. Uh, and Ontario, uh, Northern British Columbia would be considered cool. And with cooler climates, uh, uh, as, grapes, as grapes ripen, uh, what's happening is the natural is fresh acidity in the grapes. If you, eat a, if you eat a green grape in July, let's say before it's fully ripe, pretty much tastes like a crab apple. It's just packed full of acidity. Uh, and, and as that ripens and as the temperature gets warmer throughout the summer and it ripens the grapes, that acidity converts into sugar and, the, and you ripen the sugar in the grape. So cool climates, because they have less heat generally than a moderate or warm climate, will ripen, convert less of that acidity into sugar, which means that cool climate wines, pound for pound, uh, generally have high acid, uh, and because there's less sugar being produced, once that's all fermented into alcohol, there's less sugar, so there's there's less alcohol, generally speaking, in cool climate wines. Uh, moderate is kind of a balance uh, with a, some, some good amount of ripening, but still some acidity retained. And moderate climates include Bordeaux, uh, Piemonte, uh, parts of the Pacific Northwest, perhaps Southern Oregon, or certainly um, inland Washington State. We'll look at both of those in week four. And they tend to have a nice balance between 13, 13 and a half, maybe 14% alcohol, but still some, some nice uh, acidity to them, uh, some natural acidity. And then warm climates, including many parts, most of Spain, uh, southern Italy, like Puglia and Sicily, and other parts of uh, Italy. Uh, Napa Valley is a warm climate region, and the, the, uh, because the more of that acidity is being converted into sugar in the grapes with the, with the added warmth, uh, they're higher in alcohol. Uh, fuller in body, lower in acidity, and have really ripe, uh, ripe flavors. So you also get kind of a plummy, pruny uh, characteristic. Argentina definitely is warm. Uh, there are cooler pockets in Argentina, such as the very south in Patagonia, is moderate by my best estimation. Uh, and I would say also in the north, in um, um, Salta, Catamarca, in the north of Argentina, where it is fairly equatorial, I think it's 20 or 25 degrees. This is one of the ex exceptions to um, that 30 to 50 band is northern Argentina, but it's at it's in the Andes at about 3,000 meters elevation, uh, and elevation uh, uh, can can increase, decrease temperature, can increase the, the, the refreshingness. So apart from northern uh, and southern Argentina, anything like Mendoza is warm, 
Um, and, and the other provinces of, of central Argentina are warm, warm climate uh, provinces. Uh, and then with Argentina, you also get some cool pockets with, uh, even in Mendoza, like Uco Valley, if you've seen that on a label, that's further up the, the Andes Mountains in, in Western Mendoza, uh, Western Argentina. So that, that, that can moderate this warm, warm temperature. Uh, but generally, if you get a, a Malbec from Argentina, if it's more than 15 or $20, it's well produced generally, and uh, and those will be high in alcohol, at least 14 or 15 percent alcohol, uh, and usually lower, lower in acidity. And also have those ripe, uh, plummy, pruny, stewed um, uh, plum flavors. Oh, and chili. Uh, chili is uh, warm. So uh, we'll actually talk about chili in week um, four, uh, but chili is interesting because it's uh, the Pacific is a very cool influence. So if you think San Francisco is cool, you know, there's the Mark Twain quote, the coolest winter I ever spent was the summer in San Francisco. And, uh, and that's the idea that the Pacific in California, as in Chile, on coastal regions really influences the, the great growing. So coastal Chile is actually quite cool. Uh, but once you get over that coastal mountain range into the central valley of Chile, it's, it's a very warm. It's about 35 degrees latitude south, which is, which is quite a warm latitude to be to, to produce wines so to answer your question uh, uh, inland chile is is warm as well as argentina uh so we talked about climate uh, the soil is going to affect uh, the terroir and there's a great book i haven't read it yet but it's on my on my short list called um uh, i think it's called rocks grapes and vines i'm i'm not doing it justice but it's by alex maltman uh and uh considered pretty much the, the lead expert in uh, vineyard soils and vineyard uh, geology. Uh, and I, I just kind of touched a little bit on some of the major uh, soils. Um, so three of the three of the more common soils. And, and the vine is a unique plant, unlike most um, agricultural crops. It actually prefers a thinner, less fertile, less nitrogen-rich, uh, less nutrient-rich soil with less water. And that's what's going to produce the most interesting grapes and most interesting wines. Uh, so something that's really rocky, like gravel, uh, uh, with good water drainage. So gravel is defined as having larger particles uh, than, for example, clay, which is really small particles. And so they're really compact and, and retain a lot of water and kind of a dense clay. Uh, but gravel is very loosely grained. Uh, so a lot of water drains away, which means the roots have to dig deeper uh, down into the subsoil uh, to pull out more water and, and nutrients. Uh, so gravel can produce a really high quality wine, especially Cabernet Sauvignon, uh, such as in Bordeaux, of course, our very famously gravelly soils. Uh, parts of New Zealand have, have these gravel terroirs uh, and, and many other parts um, of the world. Uh, the other style of soil, so I mentioned nitrogen and nutrients tend to produce uh, uh, less quality wines and an alluvial soil, uh, which almost looks like a potting, like kind of earth. Uh, it's, it's very rich in nutrients. It's generally caused by kind of river river flows where, where the silt and soil and alluvial soil components have collected. And if you grow um, uh, grapevines in these alluvial fertile uh, plains, they, uh, they tend to put all their energy into, ripe, into producing uh, foliage. So different leaves and shoots. And generally you get a, a less quality uh, grapes because all the energies and, and resources for the vine are going into the, the green uh, green parts. So many parts of um, um, uh, uh, north northeast Italy near the Po, po River uh, are fairly alluvial. So this Pinot Grigio uh, was probably produced in, in uh, and many, many other wines from that area, Lambrusco, Chardonnay. Um, many river valleys will have alluvial soils. Uh, which is going to produce a higher yield. You get more, uh, not only do you get uh, vines that are focusing on on uh, leaves, but the vines are also producing more fruit because there's more nutrients and water available to them. So on alluvial soils, uh, you get very high yields uh, of grapes as well. Uh, and so in addition to climate and soil, the topography uh, is or the slope is going to be an influence on the terroir. 
Uh, there's an expression I love I got from uh, Jancis Robinson in the Oxford Companion to Wine. Uh, she said that the Romans, even when they're growing grapes 2,000 years ago, knew that Bacchus, Emmet Collis, uh, Bacchus is the god, the, the Latin god of wine. And Emmet Collis loves hillsides, loves slopes. And this just indicated that even Romans, in, with their fairly primitive uh, grape growing techniques, uh, uh, were, were, were planting their best vines on hillside slopes. Uh, and the reason that hillsides produce pound for pound a, a really interesting wine, perhaps more interesting, is that uh, cold air, oh, there's two reasons, air drainage and water drainage. And air drainage indicates that cold air, which is denser and heavier than warm air, will sink uh, below the hot air. And as it sinks on hillsides, it actually sinks away from the vines. And goes down to the valleys and out to the out to the sea eventually, um, uh, and that's replaced by warmer air, which is above that cold air, and that warm air recirculates over these vines uh, and and aids in the in the ripening. Uh, in addition to air drainage, you also get water drainage, which means that the soils on these hillsides, uh, the water tends to drain away from the vines, away from the soil, and away from the roots, uh, which which means again the the vines are digging deeper into the soil. And pulling out more uh, really rich uh, flavors and, and uh, micronutrients uh, to, to get that deeper subsoil uh, water. Uh, so uh, that that's um, essentially. Were there any questions on terroir or anything? Did did that make sense? Uh, had, had you thought about it before? Had you heard of terroir? Did you, did you know what it was uh, coming into today's class? Ah, very good. Alan Young, excellent book. Uh, fantastic. Uh, it wasn't too long ago. I, I just finished that uh, a couple months now. Uh, very well done. And I'm happy to make uh, book recommendations. Wine Bible is a classic. Uh, very well written by Karen McNeil. Um, some of the other ones I recommend to my students, whether it's at Niagara College or uh, Wine School in Toronto, Independent Wine Education Guild, uh, where I both also teach. Um, I do recommend Wine Bible. I recommend um, Wine Folly. I'll type that in. Have you heard of this website? Uh, it's done by Madeleine Phuket, uh, and she's she wins Wine Blogger of the Year many, many times uh, each year, or many times over the last few years. Uh, and if you go to winefolly.com, there's these great infographics. It's, it's virtually free. Uh, and great infographics, great way to learn, uh, fairly introductory, approachable, easy to understand. And she has two books that have come out with a lot of these resources, a lot of these infographics, etc. Uh, but really well done. So I recommend Wine Folly and um, uh, the Wine Bible. Uh, and also... <laughs> Very good, Chuck. Uh, in addition to Wine Bible and Wine Folly's books or website, I also recommend um, uh, uh, Windows on the World, which is uh, Kevin Raleigh's uh, wine course. It's a wine book, uh, but it's called Windows on the World. He, he, he taught at a wine school in New York and in the Windows on the World restaurant, which is at the top of the Twin, uh, Twin Towers uh, World Trade Center. Uh, and, uh, and, and so he taught courses. He's, he's one of the preeminent, uh, wine educators, uh, certainly of the United States, perhaps of the world, uh, in my opinion, and, uh, wrote a great book uh, that I'd completed again, about on the level with maybe this course or wine folly or perhaps wine Bible, uh, and just giving a general overview with again, really interesting infographics or unique perspectives. Uh, but, but a really great, really great book as well. Very good. So, so we'll we'll set aside terroir. Uh, if, again, if there's any questions, reach out. You can type them in during our class. Feel free to reach out to me, Malcolm, M A L C O L M at enologize.ca, uh, O E N O L O G I Z E uh, dot C A. Uh, but let's carry on with our class. So, uh, aside from terroir, I thought uh, some interesting ideas about uh, grape growing and viticulture is the vineyard calendar, the vine growth cycle. Um, uh, which uh, so I've, I've got here two calendars, two strips of, of the year, 
Uh, and the one on the top is essentially the vine growing season in the northern hemisphere. And then flip that six months on itself for the vine growing season in the southern hemisphere on the bottom. Uh, so in both hemispheres, the winter indicates a, um, a, a rest period, a hibernation period, where the vine shuts down and kind of goes into, into sleep mode. And that'll be from about this time, November, December, until March, perhaps, in the northern hemisphere. Uh, and also from about uh, May uh, to uh, August or uh, uh, September in the southern hemisphere. Uh, and that's important, and that's one of the main reasons you don't see a lot of high-quality viticulture in tropical regions. Uh, there is some in Thailand, India, Brazil, uh, a little bit of wine, quite a bit of wine being grown in, in those countries. Uh, uh, but the vine doesn't get a full restful winter sleep, so it can produce often two or more crops in a year in these tropical regions. Uh, and some interesting wines, especially with elevation in India or other parts, Brazil, uh, but generally high quality is between 30 and 50 and in the northern and southern hemisphere the vines will hibernate uh, over the winter uh, and so in Yes, uh, very good. So let, uh, let's let's go in, in order. So we'll talk about Varezo uh, uh, Which is the third step But the first thing that's going to happen in a vineyard cycle once it springs out of hibernation in March or April sometimes May in a really uh, you know, with our lake effect here in Ontario, sometimes bud burst, which is the first indication of vineyard growth in a calendar, uh, will occur in March or April. And that's where the, the bud, which contains all the leaves and the shoots, as well as the uh, grape clusters, uh, flowers and grape clusters, um, will, so the, the bud will burst out of the cane, which is that woody tissue. You can see the bud coming out of there. And again, six months uh, in reverse on the Southern Hemisphere. And then maybe around June, May, June, or July, perhaps. Uh, usually in June, you'll start to see flowers emerge. Uh, and uh, grapevines, almost all of them, are hermaphroditic plants, which means the cluster uh, the uh, that's going to become grapes contains both the male and the female parts. Uh, and as long as it's not too windy or cloudy or rainy during June, uh, you'll get a nice um, natural pollination of, uh, and each pollinated flower turns into one grape. Uh, so if the po flower doesn't pollinate, then there's no grape. Uh, but for each flower that does uh, pollinate, then you'll get a grape on on the cluster. And as as the and that's called fruit set. So once there's flowering, the the flowers pollinate, and the the fruit is called fruit set. Uh, once the grapes are determined. Uh, and those grapes will again be kind of green and, and kind of crab apple y. Uh, and they'll continue their march into Varaison, uh, which is a French term uh, that indicates the start of ripening of the grapes. And this is often in August, sometimes in uh, early August or perhaps late. I've seen it as, as late as early September in a really cool year uh, in Ontario. Uh, but it's a beautiful time to be in the vineyard because, as you can see from the picture, uh, red grapes, uh, it's that raison that they start to take their red color. Uh, and the other physiological effects for both red and grapes are that uh, the skin softens and it starts to get bigger, taking in sugar and water into the grape. Um, and also the flavor uh, around the skin starts to ripen. And at raison, uh, red grapes will start to turn red and yellow grapes, which or white grapes, which start off green, will start to turn golden or yellow and, and more translucent. And so you can see in this picture that the grape isn't quite ripening at the same uh, pace, uh, each individual uh, berry. Uh, so it's a beautiful time to be in, in, in a vineyard uh, where you've got these clusters that are different clusters are ripening different amounts and some are fully ripe, some are part ripe, some are unripe. And even within each cluster, there's different green and pink and red and purple uh, berries uh, on each cluster. And again, that's in August and that'll indicate the start of ripening. Uh, and then over the next late August, September, sometimes into October, this is the most crucial uh, period for good weather because uh, any rain or hail uh, uh, or cloudiness and overcast and cool weather can be detrimental to ripening. Even if you get a really hot, warm summer, uh, you, can, you can have not as good of a quality fruit if the harvest time, the September and October weather uh, doesn't cooperate. So if it is sunny, 
and warm and dry. Uh, that can further enhance the ripening. You can get some really beautiful uh, grapes and wines. And then it culminates with the with the clipping of the of the of the cluster of the grapes, uh, and that's harvest. So uh, either machine harvested or hand harvested uh, will will signify the end. And then a couple weeks later, the leaves may fall, uh, and that will indicate the the hibernation period for uh, for the vine. Did that answer your question, Alan? Very good, my pleasure. Uh, great, so uh, ticking along uh, really, really smoothly actually. Um, we'll open up the poll. So I think just one question for viticulture. Yes, so one question here on viticulture, which of the following is true of cool climates? They tend to produce wines that are A, high in alcohol and low in acidity, B, high in alcohol and high in acidity, C, low in alcohol and high in acidity, or D, low in alcohol and low in acidity. Excellent, very good, yeah, so cool climate because less temperature, less alcohol, less sugar, uh, and generally more preserved, preserved acidity. We don't really talk much about it. It's maybe more of a wine making uh, topic, uh, but just as a note on cool and warm climates, uh, in a cool climate you have enough acidity, sometimes they'll um, chaptalize or deacidify, uh, and in a warm climate um, they will often add acid back. So parts of California, Australia, uh, Spain, Italy, fr southern France, uh, often the grapes have ripened so quickly before the flavor is fully ripe that, um, that the Vigneron, the wine grower, leaves the grapes on longer to get those ripe flavors. But the acidity is so low that when they're that when they're vinifying the wine, uh, making the wine, he adds back uh, tartaric acid, which is a natural natural grape acidity, uh, just to balance the wine. Otherwise, it tastes kind of flabby and and not not very not very well balanced. Uh, so, are you okay if we if we carry on with uh, the last part of today's class? Uh, wine making. Very good. How's the pace? Is it is it too fast? Too slow? Am I talking too fast? Am I explaining terms too fast? Too slow? Perfect. Thank you, Chuck. <laughs> I don't know. He said, he said it was perfect, so I'll, I'll continue and, and again slow me down if there's any questions or if. Um, if anything's unclear, if you have any extra questions, then, then please do uh, feel free. Great, so let's uh, uh, taste some wine, and that'll be a great, uh, tasting is one of the best way uh, to learn about wine. Uh, traveling is, is, is probably the best way. Um, I've been lucky enough to do a little bit of traveling, not, not as much as I'd like to, and I, I hope that continues and increases. Uh, but traveling is such a great way to learn about wine regions and wines and people and food uh, and tasting is of course, uh, uh, you can talk about wine, which is interesting and fun and I enjoy it and love it, uh, but probably the best way is to, is to actually taste it and experience the wine. So we'll talk about oak aging techniques in, in wine making towards the, the latter part, uh, but let's taste, taste the wine as well. So if you have the Red Knot um, uh, Shiraz uh, from uh, McLaren Vale, I believe, uh, in the label, or at least Southern Australia, uh, so uh, remember the six S's, uh, so this is a good practice to get into, so C, swirl, sniff, sip, swish, savor. Okay, no problem, Chuck. Yeah, well, let's 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 go back to um, let's just take a couple couple seconds, and uh, we can pour the wine or, or whatever you like to do, and and we'll start start in just a second.
Okay, so great. Uh, welcome back. If you're watching this in the recording, uh, so you have the wine. Uh, uh, feel free to taste that. And try and go through the six S's if you recall those. See, swirl, sniff, sip, swish, savor, something like that. Uh, and and in this case, in addition to maybe getting, we talked a little bit about eucalyptus. You might be getting a red cherry or black cherry, or maybe some other nice fruit flavors. Uh, but see if you can pick out oak uh, characteristics. The last time I tasted this wine, uh, there's a really nice, notable oak, uh, vanilla, clove, maybe toast, maybe cedar. You might get a coffee or a mocha, kind of toasty, roasted characteristic. Uh, but certainly the vanilla, clove, or toast or cedar is coming from perhaps oak chips or, or oak barrels uh, or maybe oak staves uh, in the aging of this uh, red nut wine. And as you see, swirl, sniff, sip, swish, savor uh, your uh, your red wine, your oaked uh, red wine. Um, think about that, and I'll put on a video. It's a quick two or three minute video from the uh, Bureau of Wines, the the Red Wine Bureau. Yes, it's uh, definitely Alan. It's a uh, it's a high alcohol. I, I don't remember, but I think probably about fourteen percent, or maybe fourteen point five percent, depending on the vintage. Uh, so there is, there's, and tan, both tannins and alcohol have a bitter finish. So you, that's where you taste it uh, uh, you, most often is on the back of the palate, on the finish uh, for for red wines. And I suppose white wines might have high alcohol or even some some tannins from the oak. Uh, so it might be like a little little bitter, a little bit bitter finish, depending on how you feel about that. Different people have different, not only sensitivities to uh, bitterness, but also preferences. So it means that somebody might uh, really detect bitterness and enjoy it, or they might not detect it very well and not enjoy it, or any any combination uh, kind of in the middle. Uh, but I'll put it on this video, so it's a nice uh, two or three minute video from the uh, the interprofessional body of Burgundy wines, Burgoyne wines, um, and it just shows the red wine making process, which differs from the white wine making process, uh, in that the red wine Fermentation includes the skins of the red grapes. Uh, so as the grapes are ripening, they're developing red color as well as flavor and tannins um, in the skins of the red grapes. And as you know, vast majority of grapes, red grapes, that when you squeeze them, it's clear juice that comes out, uh, which means it's possible to make a white wine from red grapes, although it's not possible to make a red wine from white grapes. Uh, because only the red grape skins contain the color and the aroma and the tannins. Um, and so in red wine, you want that color as well as the flavor and the tannins. So red wines are fermented and vinified on their skins with their skins and then pressed off the skins after fermentation. Whereas white wines, they don't really have, there, there are some white wines that are made on the skins, but most, almost all commercial white wines are pressed off the skins because uh, there, there's not a lot, there's a little bit of flavor that sometimes they can use. Uh, but for all intents and purposes, white wines will be, the juice will be separated from the skins, pressed away uh, before uh, fermentation. So let's take a look at the red wine fermentation. And let me know if you, if you can see and hear this okay. It might not, might not be sound, but you should be able to see it. So this is as grapes harvested, grapes are arriving at the winery and going through the crusher destemmer. Okay, very good. Hope it's not too loud. And then the juice gets vatted, goes into a cuvee, into the tank. Red wines will almost always be fermented in tanks because it's tough to get the skins, the red skins that you need in a barrel. And so in this tank, you want to expose the skins and all that color and flavor and tannins to the wine. So they punch, punch it down or pump it over. And this is the beautiful part here, the fermentation. And then you'll, and this is where you separate the skins from the, from the wine, from the newly made wine. There's still a little bit of wine in the skin, so they'll press the skins. That has a, quite a bit of flavor and tannins. 
Uh, they will, uh, in grappa or mark pumice brandies, they'll, they can get distilled, uh, but more often than not, they go to compost uh, or just out, out to uh, recycling, gar garbage recycling or, or compost most often. This is the malolactic uh, fermentation, which is a second fermentation that converts malic apple acid into lactic acid. We'll talk about that next week. You'll separate the kind of the lees, kind of that gross lactic acid bacteria uh, from from the wine, and, and you have the clear uh, wine, which then matures or ages in oak in many wine regions, and it's going to absorb vanilla or toast or clove aromas, and then they're able to blend the different uh, wines into a final product. Have you heard of this uh, technique called fining? talk about that in a minute. It's just a clarification of the wine, just like filtering uh, will clarify and, and stabilize the wine, make sure it's sound for, for bottling, which we see here. And that's how you produce a red wine. Uh, so you should should have access to this on the PDF I sent. If you if you'd like a link to that YouTube video, I'd be happy to resend that or send that. Uh, yeah. So Bottle Shock, in addition to that that interesting movie in the early two thousands, uh, Bottle Shock is the idea that as a wine's just bottled, it takes two, one or two or maybe three weeks until the wine can settle. It's, it's tough to explain other than just the idea that when you open a wine that's just been vinified and bottled, uh, it can it can taste off. It can It's not quite together. The acidity might be out of balance. The flavors might be off and or out of balance. And that's the idea of bottle shock where from the bottling process, it's um, it hasn't coalesced or kind of come into, into its final proper wine tasting technique. And uh, I've tasted wines that have been in bottle shock. I've tasted wines that have been recently bottled and not been in bottle shock. Uh, it just, it's just something to be aware of that all wines as they're released from the, the winery that wants to sell the wine and wants you to enjoy the wine will have settled through the, through the bottle shock, three or four week uh, period bottle shock uh, time. Uh, so this is a, a fun um, infographic or uh, visualization of fermentation, uh, which is a simple simple equation. And, and even uh, said that winemaking predated uh, mankind. You know, it said the origins are maybe eight or ten thousand years ago. But uh, from Jancis Robinson's Oxford Campaign to Wine, she said that even prior to that initial civilization, uh, apes were sinking fermented seeking fermented fruit. So um, the idea that yeast, which occur naturally in the air and on the bloom on the skin of the grapes, uh, there's yeast all around us. Some are more beneficial than others, uh, but there's yeast everywhere. And so the idea that, you know, some grapes maybe fell or were, were collected in a primitive bowl, let's say, and as the grapes crushed, some of the juice was exposed, some of the wild natural yeast that were on the grape skins started to ferment that. And maybe, maybe somebody who was collecting these grapes tasted it and thought, you know, it probably wouldn't have tasted very good. It might have, might not have. Um, uh, but if it did, or if they started to feel this kind of nice elation that, that you get from tasting a newly fermented wine, uh, 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 then, then they probably said, well, let's, let's try and do this again. And, and the idea was that vine cultivation was not long after discovered or, or practiced after this idea of, you know, wild yeast ferment. Uh, so in a controlled winery, in, in modern wineries, uh, yeast are either cultured, uh, so they'll be added from a culture, or they can be indigenous or wild yeast as well, meaning in parts of Italy and France and even Ontario and California and other regions, uh, there's enough natural, good quality yeast uh, that will produce a natural fermentation uh, with, with a sugar source. So yeast feed on sugar, uh, and as part of that feeding process, they convert the sugar into alcohol, ethyl alcohol, uh, uh, which is how which is how you make a wine. And and in that process, you can see in the picture here, the yeast is is replicating. So there's 
excuse me, there's a lot of nitrogen being used and uh, and fuel source in, in the form of sugar. Uh, excuse me. So as the yeasts are, are consuming all this sugar that naturally occurs in the in the grape must and the grape juice uh, until the point where there's no sugar left and, and eventually the yeast will die and sink to the bottom. Uh, uh, but all that sugar gets converted into alcohol. Uh, and there's a byproduct is carbon dioxide, so alcohol and CO2. Uh, and what I love about grapes, one of the things I love about grapes is there's it's one of the few, if not the only, fruit that has enough sugar in it that once fermented will produce a microbiologically stable wine. So if you ferment peaches or watermelon or blueberries or cranberries, there's uh, there's less sugar in those fruits than there is in, in wine grapes. Uh, there is some sugar, but not enough to make the final fruit wine biologically stable. There's not enough alcohol to, to essentially make it stable. Uh, whereas with, with wine grapes, um, so, so with peach, peach wines and cranberry and blueberry wines, for example, they'll add some uh, uh, table, you know, white, white sugar, granulated sugar to increase that, that final alcohol. All that sugar gets converted in that peach wine fermentation into a final peach wine of a higher alcohol because some of that added uh, sugar. And they can do that in cool regions. That's what I refer to as chaptalization. Uh, which is uh, a technique invented under Napoleon's pharmacist, Jean-Louis Chaptel. Um, uh, and cooler regions will chaptalize. They're allowed to add sugar as long as it's all converted into alcohol to increase the final strength. Uh, but in warm Mediterranean regions or, or most wine regions, warm or moderate, uh, there will be enough natural sugar produced in, in wine grapes uh, to once that's all fermented to dryness to produce a uh, microbiologically -bi stable uh, final wine. So that's essentially the, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, the equation there. So yeast and sugar convert into alcohol and CO2. <coughs> excuse me. I thought I was not getting sick and I, I hope I'm not. I'll knock on wood, but um, I might be feeling a little tickle here. Uh, so, uh, so once you've fermented a wine, we saw the red wine making process, co contact with grape skins, and ferment to dryness, giving a final wine. Uh, many wines will be aged in oak. Um, uh, we're starting to see a fashion for no oak or less oak or moderate oak or old oak uh, versus new oak. And so what's, what's the difference there? So uh, new oak, uh, think of it, uh, so an oak barrel, which is made from the... Uh, either white oak, either American oak or, or French oak, will have natural aromas, uh, usually vanilla uh, or toast, for example. If it's a French uh, barrel, French oak barrel, will have vanilla or toast aromas in the oak barrel staves. And American oak has vanilla and toast, as well as clove, those are supposed to be cloves, uh, uh, coconut and dill aromas in the American oak uh, barrels. Uh, so when you use a new oak barrel, just like using a tea bag for the first time in a new cup of hot water, uh, or a new tea bag in a cup of hot water, uh, the new oak barrel is going to give the most amount of flavor to to that wine. Uh, and just like using a tea bag in a second cup of water, third, fourth, eventually the flavor kind of dissipates, and, and you're not really getting any flavor from the tea bag. And it's the same with oak, where older oak still has some benefits, like the oxidative aging of oak barrels. Uh, but there's no vanilla or toast or any of the other um, uh, oak barrel aromas uh, uh, from from old oak. Uh, so and so, what's what's often being practiced in wine regions throughout the world is a balance of a little bit of new oak with some old neutral oak, maybe some stainless steel uh, wine, on, and that's all being blended into a final wine that has some of the best attributes of of each of those um, components. Okay. Everything okay so far? Going too fast? Too slow? All good. Uh, sorry, Alan, I missed your question. To be clear, the yeast is added, not drawn naturally from the grapes. Ditto for Chuck. Uh, uh, so, so yeah, to, to clarify that, uh, I would say that you can do either. 
I'll just close the full list here. Um, so many wineries throughout the world will use what's called a cultured yeast, which is a, a, a powerful yeast. It's called Saccharomyces cerevisiae. You can type that down. It's just the species of sugar yeast, Saccharomyces. It was first discovered with, with beer, so cerevisiae. So there's Saccharomyces cerevisiae. Uh, and, and this is a cultured yeast. It produces the, the most pleasant flavors for a, for a wine. Uh, it's, it's most tolerant to alcohol as well as sulfur. Uh, and it's the strongest. It'll override other species, other types of, uh, of yeast strains. Uh, so this, this is the most common one and it's often cultured. And you can add it just in dehydrated package form into your vat of uh, fermenting grape must or soon to be fermenting grape must. Uh, and that will carry out a, a sound uh, fermentation. So that's what they call cultured yeast. And the other idea is, is what's called indigenous yeast or wild yeast or natural yeast fermentation. And this is the idea that they're not going to add um, cultured yeast. They're going to rely on the, the yeast cells that are naturally existing on the grape skins or in the winery, floating in the air or on the barrels, etc. cetera. And um, the idea is that these natural yeasts, which some of them are Saccharomyces cerevisiae, some are other strains, uh, and can all produce uh, interesting wine, and they're all converting that sugar into alcohol, uh, but they produce different flavors. And the reason it's not always practiced is because they can just as easily produce off flavors, and you can get a really wonky smelling wine from some of these odd strains of yeast uh, that are found wild or, or naturally fermenting. Uh, so they don't always do wild ferment because it's harder to control the final result. Uh, but in regions like Veneto and Tuscany and Rhone Valley and Loire Valley, Bordeaux, uh, there's such a solid base. They've been making wine for perhaps 2,000 years or more. Uh, so there's the natural strains of yeast found in these wine regions uh, produces a, a desirable, desirable wine. So often these Old world regions and even new world regions are starting to build up a nice population of indigenous yeast. Will produce a, a, a wild ferment or natural ferment uh, wine. Pleasure. Uh, let's go to the poll. So um, two two questions just to finish off our wine making section. First one is true or false? White wines are pressed off their skins before fermentation and red wines are pressed off their skins after fermentation. And that is correct. Yes, very good, both of you. So uh, absolutely true. Uh, and, and like I had mentioned, it's possible to ferment white grapes on their skins, and it's also possible to ferment a, a white wine from red grapes, <coughs> and hence press the red grapes off the skins, uh, red juice off the skins. Uh, but for all intents and purposes, it, it is true uh, as such. And last question. Which of the following is not a flavor characteristic of new American oak? Uh, so A, toast, B, coconut, C, mint, or D, cloves. Okay, so we have a, a div d division of opinion. Uh, uh, we have toast and mint. Mint is actually correct. You, um, so with toast, uh, it is possible to get a toast flavor from uh, American oak. And the reason that... Um, uh, so in the staves, in the actual wood of the American oak barrels, you get the coconut and the clove and the vanilla flavors. Uh, but where the toast comes from is in order to make a barrel, the cooperage will uh, light a flame on the inside of the barrel, the, the newly formed barrel, before putting the lid on, to toast the staves. And that allows the staves to bend into place without cracking. Because to make a, a, a wooden barrel, an oak barrel, it's just the, the wooden staves and the rings, the, the hoops. Uh, so there's no nails or glue or anything like that. So in order to physically bend the staves into place and put the rings around to make your barrel, 
uh, they need to toast it to, to, to flame the inside just en enough to soften it that it'll ply into, uh, into place. So you, you do get a toast uh, flavor from, uh, from American oak and often from, from French oak as well. And they can, they can moderate the amount of the level of toast. You can have a light toast, which will impart, impart light toast flavors, or medium toast or strong toast flavors. And if you think bourbon, uh, Jim Beam or, um, you know, Buffalo Trace, let's say, uh, bourbon must be uh, new American barrels that are uh, charred barrels, so very strong uh, toasting to bourbon uh, barrels. So great. So uh, that was that was fairly quick, quick and dirty. Uh, but I hope hope you enjoyed. Uh, were there any questions on any of today's content? We talked about uh, grape growing. Uh, so first, we talked about wine tasting, wine appreciation. We talked about grape growing, and we talked covered wine making. Uh, just a general overview. I'm hoping to develop in the in the future a uh, wine 201 and a wine 301 that will dive deeper, maybe longer courses, covering more material, uh, more in depth. But I think you may find, I hope I hope you find uh, value to, to this course. Excuse me, and as we cover these five weeks, I hope you'll, you'll get a nice taste of, of each of the major topics. And I'm happy to be guided by your questions and your curiosity um, and anything you, you're excited to, to learn about uh, this course. So again, please do reach out uh, if you have any questions and in class, of course. Very good, thank you, Chuck, glad to hear. Uh, so let's just do a quick recap, if you can fill in, uh, so from the first part of class, the four steps to wine tasting are, Chuck says, appearance, nose, palate, and finish. Very good. Alan, I presume you agree. That's absolutely the four. Chuck is correct. <laughs> good. Uh, that is the four steps to wine tasting. Also, for beer tasting or scotch tasting, you can apply the same, same four-step process. And do you care to name some of the components of terroir that we talked about? Climate, soil, slope, yield, and varietal. Very good. Climate, slope, soil, grape variety, and yield. Excellent. Exactly. Uh, and common oak flavors that we covered. I'll just post those up. So vanilla, toast, clove, and coconut, if it's American oak. Toast, yes. Very good. <laughs> Uh, great, and, and one last thing I ask, not mint, that's right, very good, Alan. Uh, one last thing I ask, each class is uh, something I learned today. This is a technique I learned uh, when I was a tutor. I'm a, I'm a qualified wine educator, qualified, uh, I have a Bachelor of Education, as well as my um, diploma in wine and spirits. Uh, and one of the techniques I like to use, or one of the ideas I like to use, is uh, what did I learn today? What was, you know, you came here, you signed up, you sat down, you had the wine, and, and Sat through listening to me talk. Uh, so, what did I what did I learn today? So, if you if you don't mind, if you can indicate something you enjoyed or something you learned uh, in today's class, that helps me um, with with my teaching. Uh, and we'll look forward to next week's class. Um, uh, so, Alan, again, if if you can check in uh, recording or if you are able to make the class, uh, again, up to you. Uh, but either way, it'll be through the link on Enologize website, uh, and that will be grape varieties. So we'll take a look at the four major white grape varieties and the four major red and talk a little bit about um, some, some other, some secondary varieties, just a, just a teaser for those.